fifth time's a charm. Good morning. Welcome to worship, you rowdy bunch of people. <laughs> Time to be Presbyterian and sit down and start worship. I'm just teasing. It's great that we have fellowship before. Um, good morning and welcome to worship uh, in person and virtually as well. Um, it's a good day to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Uh, would you turn in your book to the screen uh, and join me in our call to worship? Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, as we come into your presence today, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. May we glorify and enjoy you forever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we sing. attention to our bulletin and pray the prayer of confession with me, followed by a time of silent confession. Almighty God, we, we confess, confess that, that we are, are quick, quick to argue, argue with, with you, you our, our creator, creator and redeemer. redeemer. We have no right to talk back to you, yet we often consider your ways unjust and imagine ourselves to be wiser and kinder than you are. When the truth of your word contradicts our desires, our anger rises up and we think you unfair. Forgive us, Lord, for wanting to instruct you in mercy and in grace. Thank you for your endless patience with your foolish children. Thank you for the powerful blood of your wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, that cleanses away our sin. Thank you for clothing us in his righteousness. Hear this morning's words of assurance as contained in Psalm 103, verses 2 through 4. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. filled with thankfulness 
This morning, I'm going to be praying through Psalm 87. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to follow there, or uh, you can pull it up on your phone. But again, I'll be praying through Psalm 87. Please join me in a time of prayer. O Lord, as we come into your presence to worship you this Sabbath day, we understand, O Lord, that you reside in heaven, that you sit upon your high and holy hill, uh, and that the city of God is where you dwell. O Lord, as we are pilgrims on our way on this earth, um, we travel through cities that are not safe and not secure, and as pilgrims, where our ultimate destiny is in heaven with you forever and ever, may our eyes, uh, fixated on your Son, long for the day when we will be in your city forever and ever, and have safety and security. All the trials and the tribulations of this world will recede, uh, and you will be in all and through all. So Lord, as we are pilgrim people, may we be a congregation that is shaped by fixating our eyes upon your high holy hill, and may we wake up each and every morning wanting and desiring for heaven to come down to earth. Lord, help us to be a people that seeks your kingdom. Help us to seek King Jesus in all areas of our lives. Help us to think well about dwelling with you forever and ever. As we ascend in prayer throughout our week as individuals or as a gathered body or as a group, a uh, small group in the church, May we dwell with you, Lord, and may we think and long about praising you and singing our joys to you forever and ever. May Psalm 87 be a heartbeat of this congregation throughout our coming week and today. Lord, as we come into your presence, we know fully well that we can beseech you for the needs of this particular church. As such, O oh Lord, we pray for Casey Rayburn, we pray for Ron Kappel, 
We pray for Ruthie Rayburn, Charles Kuhn, Jim Perkins, Josh, and Diana. We also lift up the Schaefers as well. Lord, we also pray for the folks as they grief the loss of Albie Folks. I also pray, O oh Lord, for anointing of the team who will be giving him a prayer quilt this afternoon. Uh, oh Lord, your love is recorded in your word and we experience it through reading it. But O oh Lord, it is most especially mediated to us by your people because your people are anointed with your spirit. So I would ask, O oh Lord, for that group that are going over to spend time with Elon and to pray with him and his family, that they would feel your presence surrounding them and that you would administer your care, your love, your providence, your mercy and grace upon them. O oh Lord, help them through this most difficult time. We pray for Dick, Co uh, Dick Cook's family as they grieve the loss of him. And we also pray for the Presbytery of the Pacific Northwest. We pray for Parkway Presbyterian Church and their pastor, Bill Hemming. Um, I had the great pleasure of chatting with Bill an extended period of time in Presbytery, and it's, it's a great overjoy this morning to actually know who I'm praying for in the Presbytery as I seek to continue to build relationships. Um, but I know that Bill has four kids, um, and he and his wife are raising them currently. So I pray for a special anointing of him and his wife as they raise their children. May they grow up in the fear and admonition of your son, and may they confirm their baptism at a young age, never knowing a moment when they do not walk with your son side by side. I also pray, O oh Lord, that this church in Tacoma, Washington would continue to preach the gospel in season and out of season. I pray for an anointing of their session, that they lead the church well, I pray uh, for the integrity of the sacraments uh, as they are visible signs of your grace extended to the people of God. And I pray that they would be a church that prays, uh, that seeks fellowship with one another. And in a very uh, secular context in Tacoma, O oh Lord, I pray that they would be a congregation who is a city uh, of light and refuge. May they have New folks who trust in your son, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and may they do mission well, fully understanding that it is your spirit who unites us to your son, who allows us to go into very difficult places. So Lord, may you anoint that particular church. Finally, O oh Lord, we pray the words that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May we now continue to worship the Lord through giving him our tithes and offerings. Hear these encouraging words from Romans 8. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits for, with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the, f the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. The dark is overwhelming and the brightest lights grow dim. Though the word of God is trampled on by foolish men. Though the wicked never stumble and abound in every place, we will all be humbled when we see.
pray with me. Oh Lord, may you take these tithes and offerings and may you build your kingdom here in the Treasure Valley, throughout our region and throughout this great nation and the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be Good morning. My name is Henry Parker and today's New Testament scripture is Philippians 2, 5 through 11 from the English Standard Version. Again, that's Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the good news of the gospel and this wonderful testimony about Jesus, our Lord and Savior. May the reading of your word open our understanding of his sacrificial death and glorious resurrection to realize that in him we have life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hear the word. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count 
equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Please stand again to sing. can see a tape on the floor. So I, am I, okay, yeah, I can, I can just use this. <clears throat> okay, is that better? Yeah, uh, we're still making noise. Let's just go with the podium mic. <clears throat> I'm sorry, we are experiencing technical difficulties. <clears throat> Today we are continuing our summer in the Psalms and with Psalm 21. <clears throat> and uh, last week I preached on Psalm 20. Uh, Psalm 20 and 21 go together. They're a, they're a matched pair. And uh, if you were here last week, uh, you'll remember that uh, Psalm 20 was a prayer for King David as he went out to battle. And, uh, but it's also prophetically a prayer about King Jesus uh, and the battle that he fought against sin and death and the evil one, and the victory that he won for us. And Psalm 21, which come, uh, obviously comes right after Psalm 20, um, is originally 
a prayer of thanksgiving when David returned, King David returned from the battle, and it's giving thanks for the victory that he won. And once again, uh, it's about, prophetically, about Jesus. So, Psalm 21, hear the word of God. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exults. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with rich blessings and you set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you and you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him, for you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord, and though the steadfast and through the steadfast love <clears throat> Of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath, and fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth, and their offspring from among the children of men. Though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed, for you will put them to flight. You will aim, you will aim at their faces with your bows. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. The word of the Lord. Would you bow with me in prayer? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> okay, uh, once again, Psalm 20 is a prayer originally originally written as a prayer for King David when he was going out to battle. And prophetically, it's a, about King Jesus and the victory that he won over sin and death and the evil one. Uh, those are three forces of evil that we cannot fight against. We are helpless against sin. And that's why we need a savior. We are helpless against death. That's why Jesus won the victory for us when he rose from the dead and he promised because I live, you shall live also. And we're, we're no match for the evil one, for Satan. Uh, the forces of, the spiritual forces of evil in this world far outmatch us. They're more clever than us. Uh, they're more powerful than us. We can't defeat them. Only Jesus can and Jesus has. So now Psalm 21 was originally written as a prayer when David returned from battle and uh, giving thanks uh, for uh, giving thanks for his victory in the battle. And once again, prophetically, it's a prayer giving glory to God for the victory that King Jesus won 
for us. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about King David or about King Jesus, um, there's, there's a little bit of uh, context that's necessary. Um, so we're going to go back into the history of God's people, Israel. Um, during the period of the judges, before, uh, before the Israelites had a king, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, asked the old prophet Samuel, give us a king, anoint a king for us. Well, God said that the people, God, God spoke and spoke to Samuel and said that the people wanting a king means that they... God said, they have rejected me as king. And Samuel warned the people, uh, look, you may think you want a king like the other nations, but a king will eventually become a tyrant. And a king will abuse you and rule over you harshly. But the people said, we want a king like the other nations. Now, uh, sometimes that's interpreted as if God never wanted a king for Israel. That's not true. The, the fault in the Hebrew people was not that they wanted a king. Their fault was that they wanted a king like the other nations. A king who would glory in his own prowess and strength, a, a king who would glory in his own uh, military skill and uh, power. But God wanted a king for his people who would rely on God and give, give glory to God. In Psalm 21, written by King David, we find uh, the words, um, remember K King David, the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. And King David had a lot of flaws, but when in his sin, he always, like a compass, returned to the Lord. So look at how Psalm 21 begins, written by King David, with an affirmation that God and his power are what moves David to rejoice. Verse 1. O Lord, in your strength, let me begin again. O Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices. And in your salvation, how greatly he exults. You see the difference between a, a pagan king who would glory in his own strength and might and David glorying in the strength and might of the Lord. This is a prayer of a king who sought not his own glory, but the glory of the Lord. And verses 2 through 7 follow with a list of the blessings that God showered on David. Uh, verse 2, you, would give, you have given him his heart's desire. And what he's referring to there is victory in battle. Verse 3, you meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. More about that later. Verse 4, he asked life of you 
and you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. Now this is a big hint that this prayer is not just about David uh, because David grew old and died. Uh, he didn't live on forever and ever. His reign came to an end. Psalm 21 is ultimately about King Jesus. Look at verse 3 again. You meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. The, in the early church, they interpreted that as um, setting a crown of fine gold upon his head. That when Jesus rose from the dead and 40 days later ascended into heaven, the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 5 says that God exalted him and placed him at his right hand. That means the position of ultimate authority. That's the same as placing a crown on his head. Psalm 21.5 says his glory, that is the king's glory, is great through your salvation Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. And once again, the early church interpreted that, and we should interpret it too, as about Jesus. When Jesus ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father, and one day he shall come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, um, That exaltation of Jesus is what Psalm 21.5 is talking about. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. Uh, Romans 1.4 says, He, that is Jesus, was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. <clears throat> because of the actions of God the Father in exalting Jesus, we, has, we his people can be confident in, that his ultimate victory is coming. We don't need to doubt that at the end of history, Jesus will triumph over all evil. And he will reign in peace and love and justice forever and ever. Look at verse 8. <clears throat> your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. And once again, the early church interpreted this, and we should too, as the return of Christ to judge the world in righteousness. Verse 9, you will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. Uh, the Lord will swallow them up in his wrath. Fire will consume them. Once again, uh, that's talking about the, prophetically, about the judgment of Christ when he returns. Verse 11, though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. The world is constantly planning evil, isn't it? Against the Lord and um, against uh against his church. Though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. Psalm 21 is a prayer of thanks for King David's victory in battle, but on a much deeper level, it's a hymn of praise for the glory and victory of King Jesus. So, Let's talk about 
being in the kingdom of Jesus. One of the sweetest and most encouraging things that Jesus said to his followers is recruited, uh, is recorded in Luke 12, verse 32. Jesus said, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. To give you the kingdom. Uh, you and I are kingdom oriented. We will give ourselves to one kingdom or the other. And I talked about this last week and I'm going to talk about it again today. We will give ourselves to one kingdom or the other. We will either crown ourselves as king or queen and, uh, have a little kingdom all of our own, a little kingdom of one, or we will bow the knee to King Jesus and enter into his kingdom. Fear not, said Jesus. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. All you have to do is surrender and bow the knee to Jesus. And here's what is important for us to understand. God the Father did not send his son into the world in order that you and I could make our claustrophobic little kingdom of one work. God the Father sent Jesus into the world so that we could enter the kingdom of God. Now, in our little kingdom of one, we think we think we know what's best for us, but we don't. We think we're perfectly capable of ru ruling over our own lives, but we aren't. We set our hearts on things we think will make us happy, but they won't. We think we can defend ourselves against temptation, but we can't. We think we can keep evil out of our little kingdom but we can't. Every human being in this world is in need of a king. Every person in this world that has ever lived is in need of rescue and forgiveness and mercy and refuge and protection that they are unable to give themselves Every person in this world is fighting a battle. A battle that we cannot win on our own. What well, I, I should say, every Christian is fighting a battle. Not every person in this world. Uh, because those that belong to the world, there's no battle to fight. Christian, you are fighting a battle. against sin and death and the evil one. And you can't win it on your own. In Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Do you hear the echo of Psalm 21? Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And once again, if you don't belong to Jesus, you're not fighting a battle against these forces because you're captive to them. But if you belong to Jesus, you're in a battle. You're in a fight. And Paul says this. Uh, sorry, I keep wandering away from the microphone. Maybe, maybe if I take that off, I'll... <clears throat> Paul says this, be strong in the Lord. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil. Paul says this, first of all, because the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. But second, it was his experience that life on this side of eternity is a battle. When he tells his readers to put on the full armor of God and get ready for war, it means that life in the kingdom of Jesus must be lived out in the context of a spiritual battle. Now, what is this war about? It's the great battle for sovereignty over our hearts. This side of eternity, we will always have sin and rebellion living in us. We are still torn, this side of eternity, we are still torn between our little kingdom of one and wanting to make ourselves king or queen and the kingdom of God. We are still tempted to rule over ourselves, and we think that means freedom. It doesn't. It means captivity. We still think that we can write our own rules. We still tend to value comfort and pleasure more than we value serving Jesus. We are still tempted to have more excitement in the things of this world than we do with our status as sons and daughters of God. We still complain when trials come our way, don't we? When God sent us those trials to make us holy, to sanctify us. Now, this great spiritual battle is not unusual or exotic. Every Christian who has ever lived has experienced it and lived it, and you and I must too. It's, it's the normal Christian life. And the contest, the battle for our hearts will go on between King Jesus and a deceptive enemy until that enemy is finally under the foot of King Jesus. And the full armor of God reminds us that God has equipped us for this battle. Remember, Paul says, Rely on the Lord and his strength. Remember, remember King David, the beginning of Psalm 21. The king exults in the Lord and in his power. The beauty of the victory of Christ, of his life and death and resurrection, is not only that we've been forgiven, and loved and showered with grace. 
the beauty of Christ's victory over sin and death and the evil one is that we've been invited into the kingdom of God. We've been invited into the kingdom of the most powerful and the only perfect king in the universe. He blesses us with what no human kingdom can ever give. He showers us with forgiveness and reconciliation and peace and hope. He protects us when we don't have the sense to protect ourselves. He rules over situations that seem to us to be out of control, but they're not. They're under his control. He puts his kingdom in our hearts and rescues us from all other things that would rule over us. He patiently teaches us that we are not created to live as kings and queens and fearfully trying to protect our own little monarchy. He teaches us what it means to rest in his kingship and his glory, and he encourages us with the truth that his kingdom will prevail. I've told you many times before, I've read the back of the book, Jesus wins. Are you fighting a battle today and trying to win what you cannot win and trying to build what you cannot build? Or are you resting in the victory of King Jesus? Are you exulting and praising and thanking God for the victory of King Jesus that he shares with you? Are you resting in the peace that it is the good pleasure, said Jesus, it is the good pleasure of your Father to give you the kingdom? Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We sing and praise your power. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, thank you now for Psalm 21 and the great truth that is conveyed here, that Jesus has won the victory over sin and death and the evil one. And because of that, we are welcomed into your kingdom of love and grace, and we dwell secure. Father, forgive us for trying to build and live in our own little kingdoms. We are so foolish. But give us grace. Give us grace to have complete confidence in the victory of Jesus. The victory that he won through his cross and resurrection and his final victory that will surely come when we will dwell with you forever. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand and... uh, Join me in the affirmation of faith. Uh, Today, the affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed. It's printed in your bulletin. Church, what do you believe?
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. Fellowship Group, Christ Presbyterian Women, CPW, um, is having uh, their monthly luncheon next Saturday at the, this, this coming Saturday at the Ministry Center. Today is the last day to sign up uh, because they need a number. Uh, and so there's a sign-up sheet over here. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. There's a sign up sheet over here on the information table. Go now in peace. 
love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you now and abide with you evermore. And there is in your bulletin a responsive dismissal. Church, where are you going? Glory to God. Amen. Amen.